trigger warning. Some people may find topics discussed in this episode difficult. Please proceed with caution. You're listening to The Frankie Files. FrankieFilesPodcast.com Cults, Coercion, and Sexuality in Society. These are the topics for The Frankie Files. I'm Frankie Tease, your host, and I'll continue to focus on my own family story as well as news and recovery info for those who've survived, especially the adult children of cults. New each Tuesday. See FrankieFilesPodcast.com for more. You're listening to Atlantis Risen. Performed by the Daughters of Isis circa 1980s in Morningland. 50 Years a Cult. Hey everybody, today we'll begin a three-part series called The Morningland Papers. I have brought in a special guest, Lisa Van Arsdale. Lisa Van Arsdale is a cult researcher and lover of all things religious. She's visited cathedrals, temples, and other holy sites around the world and has spent quality time with countless active members of Scientology, the Amish, the Latter-day Saints Church, the Moonies of Unification Church, and many others. To see her interviews and written pieces about these culty encounters, go to her website, lisavanarsdale.wordpress.com, and be on the lookout for her brand new upcoming podcast, Lisa Joins a Cult. Thanks to Lisa for these amazing insights, which you will hear today on the podcast. Morningland is a sex cult. Let's get started. Back to the roots. Donato and Sri Patricia were married and they founded Morningland Church and immediately formed a harem around him. Oops, I mean a spiritual order of gopis. Like in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna had 10 or 12 gopis around him, who were all his wives in spirit. The vow of silence by these gopis has remained intact since 1973. I was never a gopi, but a gopi in training. And having been near the top for multiple years before leaving, I'm the highest ranking member so far to attempt to expose the sex cult that is Morningland. Next, a homosexual man, we'll call him Eon, is drawn into training. He was going to be a healer, a spiritual reader, an astrologer. He's very committed. He's single. And he's immediately paired with a man named X-1, who he has to service. That's part of the training. No penetration. He's supposed to service him orally, whether he wants to or not. This is part of his training. This homosexual man was also directed to get a vasectomy. Uh Uh-huh. Why? Well, he was told by Sri Donato, it will help preserve all sexual energy which is to serve the master. So yeah, the master is a vampire. The man eventually left and told some of his brief story on x-morninglanders.com a few years ago. Um, I think the whole vasectomy thing is a load of nonsense. I mean, 
obviously there's like a lot of unhealthy stuff happening here. The whole like you're assigned to a person whether you like them or not and are obligated to do sexual things with them thing. That's like super unhealthy. That's breaking a person's spirit. That's leaving them vulnerable to further things and further mind control and further control in general. That's a great way to break someone and keep and make it really difficult for them to leave. Um, but also like to make it so that one person is serving the other. Something my therapist talks to me about all the time is unhealthy sexual dynamics as far as um, uh, power goes, like the um, the power dynamic. And that's just like, unless that's like genuinely what you're into and both partners involved have arrived at that organically and are doing it consentingly, you can't just like decide that that's how it works for people. They need to arrive at that on their own. If, if they're into that, that's their business, but you can't just assign it not healthy and also with the vasectomy thing a this man is gay so there's <laughs> it's not like he would ever need a vasectomy for what a vasectomy is for which is to keep you from impregnating and also the whole like it's gonna curb your sexual energy thing that's not true keeps you from procreating it doesn't keep you from having sexual desire like what a load of nonsense <laughs> One waitress was recruited directly by the master Sri Donato after an astrology reading on Catalina Island where she worked. You see, she wore sunglasses and you could see that she had an abused relationship by the shiner in her eye. She moved from Catalina Island, seduced by the master, to Long Beach. She lived there full time, which was also illegally not zoned for living, which they still do. She quit her job and was invited to leave her abusive boyfriend and live full time at the temple. She, the waitress, we'll call her Cat, was then paired with a new recruit who was not even a disciple yet. They were sexually paired. We'll call him Navy. He was wanting to leave the Navy and encountered Morningland while on leave from the Navy base in Long Beach, California, where they're located. This is somewhere in the 80s. The leader, Sri Donato, paired Cat and Navy. It lasted for a few months. Then Cat left. You see, I witnessed Cat being used to further attract Navy in. That was the goal. Once he was getting laid on a regular basis, he thought he'd struck gold. He was out of the Navy now, and he was full-time at the Master's feet as a disciple. He had the master's approval dating Kat, but after she left, he was hooked and fooled. The master then completed her goal by switching him, pairing him with an immediate teacher who he had to sexually service. This is called sexual disorientation. See, the master set down rules for devotees. There was no more penetration, no more coital sex. Clearly, they didn't want breeding. But it was presented that all energy, once your disciple, must belong to the master. And if you have coital sex, you release too much of it. And in fact, he was being sucked into a different sex ring inside the sex cult Morningland community. So wildly unhealthy. So you said that this, this girl out on Catalina... And she was in a bad living situation with her boyfriend. This is something that cults do. I mean, like, all sorts of people join cults for different reasons. But one of the, like, the key people groups that you can look at are people who are going through a really rough transition or a really tough chapter of life, whether that's the incredibly taxing experience that is being in the military or having an abusive boyfriend and feeling like you don't have an exit strategy. Those are people who have nothing to lose <laughs> for a better day-to-day uh, -day living situation. So I can completely understand why both of them were in the market for a new community and were um, too vulnerable to that 
sort of situation, like, we know that a lot of groups will use the sexy ladies, you know, like, to get people, the the children of God had flirty fishing, Mm -hmm. the people who hand out the pamphlets are the pretty ones, you know, the charming, the bubbly, so that's all very, like, predictable, we're not going to do the weird to you until you're so far in that you're not going to want to leave, and it is so devastating if you're paired with someone and you've been sexually intimate and you have this incredible bond, especially when you're coming from a shitty situation like it sounds like both of them were, to then have that separated, that'll really devastate a person. That's really breaking their spirit and leaving the door wide open to then manipulate them in other ways. So this is all sounding like very textbook. What about couples, Lisa, you ask? Well, how did the couples fare in this sex cult? Some were actually broken up immediately. Many reasons were always given, always spiritual, a directive from the master. You're not on the same spiritual level. You're not soulmates. One couple, Gobi Shokru, who is now the chief financial officer of Morningland, had her marriage dissolved before my eyes. The master only wanted the female. Truth be told, so that's what she got. Sadistically, Shokru's husband, we'll call him Steve, followed every directive obediently as he was told upon meeting the master. The couple became close in training to the master. He thought that all the directives given would better and save his marriage. In reality, it never would because the master only wanted the girl. She broke up the marriage and then directed the woman that she was to service her, the master. This is her new pairing. The master had Gopi Shokru as her concubine and the marriage was dissolved. That's what breaking up her marriage was about. She would be by her side soon. Someone would service her. Steve eventually left. Like, if you really want to mess with a person's well-being, mess with their sexual experiences. Like, there's a reason that people who have experienced sexual trauma are in therapy on and off for their entire lives. It's, it's just such, a, like, an intimate core part of who you are that it really, really strikes a chord um, when you f*** with it. As Mm -hmm. far as the whole, like, she belongs to me now, I'm ending your marriage thing, this is yet another example from this group of breaking up secure attachments. And it, it made me think about how, so Mormon missionaries, who I've spent a fair amount of time with hearing about their everyday lives, What they do is they're never allowed to be alone unless they're in the bathroom. So they're always in the car uh, doing volunteer work, even sleeping with in the same room as their partner. They're only ever alone to, like, shower and take dumps. Um, But also, and that's so that they'll never be alone with their thoughts Um, or, like, alone on the phone or anything. There's always someone else they're eavesdropping. But they also change their partners periodically, whether that's every few weeks or every few months. They also will move people around so that you're not partnered with the same person for the entire duration of your mission. And that's so that they're not forming secure attachments. Because if you get comfortable enough with that person, and like in most cults, that's like, you know, a trauma bond opportunity waiting to happen. You're away from home. You've got all of these expectations on you. You're not with anyone else. You could become really, really close to that person. Um, so to then be like, okay, that's it. Now you're going to start from zero with this other person. That will keep you <laughs> in a level of despair mm-hmm. that will make it very difficult for you to leave or to think because if you're with the same person that whole time and you have that bond from being in a distressing situation together, you might both start thinking and conspiring about leaving or questioning or being like, you know what, the leader said this and that doesn't 
doesn't make sense to me. Does it make sense to you? And those conversations might continue. So groups like this really, really rely on breaking up secure attachments like this marriage and kind of using it to trim the fat, like whoever is the most devoted to me after I break up their marriage, they'll stay and I'll make good use of that. And if the other partner leaves, well, that means they were a weak link in the chain anyway. So that's fine. I've, I've salvaged what I can from this relationship that I broke up. Next, the story of one family who came to Morningland. In 1974, a single mom with two daughters, age eight, had and enjoyed Sunday services. She came by invite, and the family loved it. Singing, chanting, togetherness, holding hands, meditation, astrology readings were very exciting. By age 12, the sisters were in a singing group at the temple. At age 14, they were told they were special because they were virgins. They were initiated in a ritual abuse, and they were called the Daughters of Isis. They were made to have a three-way with a female clergy member, a gopi. The mom was kicked out, and the daughters became sexual servants to two clergy women. Both sisters eventually ran away, and the family was barely able to survive struggling emotionally over decades to reconnect. This is the story of me and my twin and my mother. There are no words that can like tell you how heartbroken I am on your behalf that this happened, this situation apart. We've got a single mom with two girls to worry about. She's looking for, you know, community. She's looking for support and for consistency in life, those are all things that people gain from their church communities. And if they're in a healthy one, that's great. But if they're not, boy, can that go bad quickly. Um, and it seems to me like this group took one look at your family and were like, we can play the long game with this. Maybe we keep all three. Or maybe we just groom these two little cuties. Because who, like, that's the, the fantasy, right? Twins, like attractive twins. That's like, you know, got to be a huge thing on Pornhub. You were like, we'll play the long game. We're going to we're gonna just get them right where we need them to be so that by the time they grow to be a heartbreaking story. I am so sorry that this is a thing in your life and that we live in a world where women can't be as empowered as they would need to be to be able to, to take care of two little girls, have a healthy life. It's terrible. And... They really played the long game with you guys because I grew up in like a very purity culture situation where you get a purity ring and you're, you're you know you're saving yourself for your husband. And as soon as you said that you were told you were special because you were virgins, I was just like, ew, gross me out the door. People's worth being determined by their virginity, which is a complete nonsensical pseudoscientific construct to begin with. For anyone who doesn't know, the hymen can grow back. Virginity is not a thing. If you want to learn more about that, I recommend reading um, Come As You Are by Dr. Emily Nagoski. Virginity is not a thing. It is not a thing that determines your worth. <laughs> and it's certainly not a thing that determines a girl's worth. I'd be very curious to know if they were telling little boys, oh, you're special because you've never stuck your girl for these money. Probably not. This is something that we do to the ladies in our society. And I hate the way that they groomed you over so many years. It all plays out like some sort of culty porno. It's gross. I'm, you completely have my condolences and my empathy. You're listening to The Frankie Files. FrankieFilesPodcast.com You're invited to a reading, astrology reading or a Sunday service or yoga class. Just know that all of that is the storefront. My mom was never trafficked into the sex cult. She was a working member, tithing 80% of her income for 10 years. That's at 2600 East 7th Street. Her daughters, however, were separated from her. 
and were both recruited into very inner circle of the sex cult. There were multiple rings. The schmucks donating their income went to classes and Sunday services. Those who were full-time disciples were in training, quote marks. If you were offered to be in training, it's soon after that you'll be given some sort of sexual directive. Um, I'm not a fan of any of it. I just kept thinking of things that we know to be true of groups like this or of sexual abuse in general. Like you were saying toward the beginning about how um, you're not allowed to tell anyone that this is happening to you. That's what abusers do, especially like ab abusers of children. They say, don't tell mom or dad because they don't want anyone to know. Something that cults do is they make sure that you don't have all of the shocking information until you're already involved enough that you probably won't leave. Uh, that's like such a textbook sexual abuse thing, especially if you think about children, like the adult molesting them or whatever always says, don't tell mom, don't tell dad, or I'll, you're, you'll be in trouble because you did this, or you'll, or I'll kill your family or whatever. There's always some sort of don't tell people that this is happening to discourage you from doing just that because that would end things. Like something that cults do is they never give you the shocking shit up front. They want to wait until you're pretty deep in to be able to like convince you to stay pretty thoroughly to get anyone able to that point in order for this to be sustainable for them. If someone is attending regularly, if they're giving their 15%, if whatever mind control tactics they're using are working effectively, um, they're going to be able to do what they need to do. And also, cults love to break up secure attachments. Secure attachments and the support that you get from them are what helps you to, like, feel supported and to leave. And so it makes a lot of sense that they would separate you from your mom because that adds a nice little layer of distress for her and a nice little layer of distress for you even if neither of you want to admit it to yourselves and that's going to take up a lot of your energy um there's also like sunk cost fallacy at play there where it's like well i already gave up my daughter so i guess i better stay because what would be worth giving up my daughter to then leave you know so i i got to put my money where my mouth is. And... So if you were a neighbor of Morningland Church and you didn't know it was a sex cult and you stumbled upon this, how would you feel? Physically ill is what I would imagine. There have been, unfortunately, a couple times in my past where I've witnessed something unsavory happening, like of a sexual nature, like, you know, adults hitting on children, things like that. And I just remember the sinking physical feeling of this is not right like moving through my body like the nausea and like the chill that comes with it so I would imagine that that would be how I would feel hmm. um <laughs> as for what I would do that would be a real quick call to the police the CPS uh like real quick I wouldn't waste any time with that it, I, I am sure that even after that initial illness you know, doing what you need to do as far as contacting law enforcement and everything goes, the shock of that would stay with you for a very long time. Like, whether it's a meth house or someone who has been, like, keeping a lady in the basement for 25 years, when it finally makes the news, the neighbors are always like, oh, they were really nice. They would give us the apples off their trees. You know, like, we know <laughs> was coming at all we were always happy to let them borrow a cup of sugar like it's it's just one of those things that only ever comes out of the clear blue sky because if you're gonna do something like that you're gonna be meticulous or you won't be able to pull it off it, it behooves them to be as careful as possible well, we could, like, you know, sit here all day and talk about what is a cult, what is an occult, are all religions cults, or is there some redemption there, etc. Growing up in purity culture, I had no way of fending for myself. Like, this was presented to me as normal, as noble, as the way to be, as the way to please God, and why wouldn't you want to please God? 
it took getting older and developing critical thinking and having life experience outside of that bubble for me to now as a 34 year old be able to say, wow, that was fucking weird. <laughs> but when you're in it and it's all you know and it's been presented as normal, it is normal. When I visit these groups, I do often think about, like I was at the 12 tribes a couple months ago and I was having dinner with them and I was sitting next to these sweet little girls who I just, I think about them all the time and I love them. And this is their normal. This is all that they know. They know that visitors like me from the outside world come in sometimes and that we live differently. They make it very, 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 very hard for you to ever leave because they paint the outside world as inferior and as sinful and as a scary place that why would you ever want to go there? And also you wouldn't have the resources to go if you did want to because you know, they don't have their own money or assets or anything. But yeah, that's something I think about a lot is things are just presented as normal. And that's why so many cults have it built in the, into their core values to birth as many children as possible. The whole like, we're pro-life, we're pro-family, God wants us to be a family uh, type stuff. Um, because it's a hell of a lot easier to keep a group going if you're indoctrinating babies, you know, like you're making members from scratch. At 34 years old, you know, however many dozens of sexual partners I've had, and was like, hey, in case you were wondering, God wants you to save yourself for your husband, and you should never look at porn Or when you masturbate, you're cheating on your future husband and God has this perfect person picked out for you, but you're going to have to love God enough first for him to ever come along. Your Prince Charming, I'd be like, sir or ma'am, please get out of my face with your crazy. But when you're prepubescent and they tell you and you haven't wandered into that part of life yet, why wouldn't you go for it? Lisa, you once said to me, religion is so big, it's invisible. Can you explain that? Yes. Yeah, so that's a concept um, that I learned a long time ago. I, I was, um, I was, how do I explain this? I was at like a seminar type thing where they asked us to list things that we could see in the room. So people are like, okay, uh, chairs the carpet, the art on the walls, uh, there's there's windows and there's curtains and there's people and there's hats that the people are wearing. They're like listing all of these things and they're like, okay, keep going. And we're like getting a little more meticulous. Like, okay, um, there's handbags. People here have handbags. There's t-shirts. People are wearing t-shirts. Uh, there's pens. People have pens inside their handbags. Like, where are we going? <laughs> like, when is this going to be over? And then the teacher lady was like, what about air? And we were like, yes, there's air in the room. And then she was like, sometimes things are so big that Mm -hmm. they're invisible. As far as like, like quantifying the thing that there's the most of in that room, the answer isn't handbags and it's not chairs. There's more air than there is people in that room. But you're not thinking about it because it's so big that you can't see it. Right in front of you, like a sex cult on the corner of 7th and Molino? Exactly. Sometimes things are just so big that we don't even, that it takes, you know, like a pretty big awakening for us to, to realize that they're a problem. Someone growing up, you know, like the average four-year-old in 1961, do you think that they thought that segregation was a problem? No, it was all they had ever known. They probably didn't even notice it happening. It took, it took a larger moral consciousness to, to make changes there. But yeah, sometimes things are so big that they're invisible. And when it comes to societal change, those are the things that we need to ask ourselves. Like, what here is so big that it's invisible? 
I chased you down for your insights on this religious sect, and I don't regret it. We're looking forward to your work with Saren Warner on the upcoming podcast, Lisa Joins a Cult. She has done so multiple times and has the stories. Thank you, Lisa, for all that you imparted to us today. And we look forward to your work. And you can find her in the show notes with details. Lisa, thank you. Thank you, Frankie, so much. Thank you.